Are, the, are any of you familiar with technical standards and how they're created and what they're all about? Uh, yeah, standards such as Wi-Fi is, a, is a very good example. USB I like to use. These things really shape the world in ways that people don't realize, and they touch your lives every single day. So I'm going to talk about their importance, a little bit of history, how standards accelerate innovation. So people sometimes think standards are stagnant and boring, but they actually accelerate innovation instead of um, slowing things down. I want to tell you about a modern standards paradigm for global standards that is just now being uh, discussed around the world. It's something that you will not have heard of before because we just talked about it. it uh, we launched it at the end of, of August of this year. And then finally, I want to talk a little bit about standards in education and some of the material that's available in case you want to further your education in standards while you're at the university. So as you can imagine, technical standards are everywhere that you see. Wi-Fi, uh, smart grid, USB, Ethernet, even the electrical socket in the middle, that's a standard um, from one country to the next. Uh, I wish it were all the same, but it's not. I've never seen a socket like this that has USB right next to it. Uh, I don't know where this picture came from, but you can see that's the evolution of the electrical socket is that USB will be charging things as well. The quote on the top is from Ken Olson, who founded Digital Equipment. And those of us in the standards business think this is rather amusing, that the nice thing about standards is there are so many to choose from. Because normally when you think of a standard, you think there should be one. But in reality, there are countless numbers of standards, thousands of standards organizations around the world producing them, and of course, all industries and uh, social change and so forth that uses standards to leverage their um, advancement. The quote on the bottom is from me, from the book that I wrote, and I have to emphasize that the Ten Commandments has no religious connotation whatsoever. <laughs> I put that in the intro, you know, no, this is not anything that has to do with God. This is just my experience going through many, many years of working in standards. So what I firmly believe is that we in industry and we in academia, we in the government, we should cooperate on standards and then fiercely compete on the products that use those standards. And that's the formula that works best in the world of standards in the industry. So standards actually accelerate innovation. Once, once a technology or a method or a process has been proven to be successful, then it's appropriate to standardize it. But that's not the end of it. What happens then are products are built on top of it, those products emerge with possibly new versions of the standard being required, and the standard itself will evolve along with the technology and along with the products. So at the top you see USB. I recently had the pleasure of interviewing the president of the USB Implementers Forum. And in the second part of my presentation, I'll tell you where you can watch that interview. But they described how USB is moving from uh, regular just connectivity to now being a charging mechanism. And super speed USB, which has uh, phenomenal speeds that, and, and rates that you can charge things. What was most encouraging is the future of USB will be no longer do we have the separate power cords for different computers and so forth. You'll be able to charge one thing with USB exclusively. And I can't wait because I'm tired of you know, carrying around all the adapters and all the plugs and so forth. Um, DDR is another good example. DDR has been progressing from DDR2, DDR3, DDR4, and it will continue as the technology advances. Um, and even JPEG moving into MPEG, the motion picture um, entertainment group that is used for um, video and audio and all that type of uh, communications. Those standards continue to evolve. The chart on the bottom shows the progression of Ethernet, so from twisted pairs all the way up to fiber optics and the incredible uh, advancements that, that Ethernet has brought. And so if you imagine what the world would be like without Ethernet, it, well, it's kind of hard to imagine to, to, to that extent. So not only do the products evolve, but so do the standards, and then the products, and then the standards. And so in lockstep, that's why standards accelerate the innovation. By the way, when I'm talking about standards today, I'm talking about technical standards. I'm not talking about educational standards or standards of human behavior. There are all, all, those I wouldn't touch anyway. But uh, these are all technical standards that will help products and, and services. So as you can imagine, everywhere you look, there are personal health care devices, 
uh, that is either a heart rate monitor, well, that, that seems to be monitoring heart rate, body temperature, um, a variety of things in that handheld device on the left. Um, at the bottom, we're representing smart electric meters that will measure how much electricity you use. And then if you happen to be generating electricity, if you have a wind tower or some type of a solar mechanism, you can actually put that electricity back on the grid and be paid for that. So these smart electric meters are going to be prominent uh, throughout the world over the next, say, decade or so. Mobile phones. Where would people be without their mobile phones? You know, it's like this these days. And uh, I was just sharing both. Uh, we have the new Samsung Galaxy S3, which is a beautiful machine. And uh, you know, the, these kinds of evolutions are just as rapid as you can imagine. Um, I don't know if you've tried the Google Talk where you actually can see someone's face and, and uh, my son and I were playing with that the other day. It's, it's phenomenal. Yeah, not yet. Yeah. <laughs> well, you don't need to because they, they have a, a feature in there where you can change your facial expressions. So you can make your eyes grow big and you can make your nose small. And you change. It's, it's really hilarious. You have to try it. Uh, and finally, probably one of the most uh, life-changing and life-altering things that we have in the world right now is the internet and the World Wide Web. Every single one of these has standards at the heart of it to make it work and make them function with each other. So what's coming in the future? I'm sure you've heard of cloud computing. Cloud computing is changing the nature of communication, of data storage, being able to handle what they call big data, which is massive amounts of information all around the world that are delivered either privately or publicly uh, on the cloud. The smart grid is something that will revolutionize the way that electrical grids are delivered in, in countries. So India, I don't know if you heard the story recently where India's power grid had gone down in most of the country. There were 600 uh, million people without power. If you've ever been to India, the power flickers on and off all the time. So smart grid will have an awesome effect in a country like India to keep their power stable, as well as to be able to move where power requirements and demands happen and remove power from where there's a surplus. And all of this is, interestingly enough, using information and communications technology. So all kinds of IT things are behind the smart grid. Have you heard of the Internet of Things? Anybody heard of the IoT Internet of Things? This one is really going to be cool. Basically, every object will have its own IP address, so things will be able to communicate with each other as if they're computers on the internet. And so the story I've been telling in Armenia is, if your refrigerator detects that you've run out of eggs, it'll send a message to your car and tell your car to drive over to the store and pick up some eggs and bring them back. Uh, some of this already exists today. The car that I drive has RFID chips in the tires, and so it will send me email when my tire pressure gets low. Uh, so all of these kinds of things will make it odd to become smarter and become connected with things all around the world. And of course, they, they won't take over humanity. Is any, no, but I don't know if anyone here is old enough to remember the old movie called The Forbin Project. It's a great old movie. It's really corny. If you go see it, you can find it on YouTube. But there's a Russian computer and an American computer, and they're talking to each other. And then they decide that the computers are going to take over the world and destroy all mankind. It's, it's a really great old um, sci-fi movie. But of course, human beings triumphed in the end. Does that mean that uh, IRS has like, blocked my uh, refrigerator from opening up? They probably already can. <laughs> um, there's always the element of Big Brother. There's always the fear of privacy invasion. Um, there's the 1984 story from Elvis Huxley, you know, that, and I, I personally think that for every good thing that we invent, there's going to be something bad, but yet humanity is always going to persist. I, I don't think we'll destroy ourselves. Um, so I think if the IRS does spy on your refrigerator, you'll figure out a way to put a little piece of duct tape on top of the camera or something. <laughs> Uh, here are some other uh, future innovations based on standards. E-governance will allow more efficient communication between nonprofits, governance, um, industry. It's a way to control documents and supply chains. Things like that will be very, very helpful in making the world operate more efficiently. E-health, of course, will revolutionize the healthcare industry around the world. I've been um, 
just a tiny bit working with an organization that wants to create a mobile platform of medical devices based on standards to take to remote areas of Africa and deliver better health care to areas that do not have hospitals and don't have good equipment. The um, automated cars are fascinating. So in Silicon Valley, you can actually see Google's driverless cars going down the highway all by themselves. They have a, um, like a satellite radar thing spinning on the top, which is accessing the internet, looking forward to where the traffic patterns are, deciding when to turn left, when to merge, how fast, how close they can go to each other. It's absolutely astonishing. The uh, cars actually will have people sitting in the front seat, so, but their hands are not on the steering wheel. They are there to give instructions. Please take me to Synopsis headquarters, or please take me over to um, you know, the Armenian ambassador, or some, something like that. And then Google, of course, with all of its knowledge, will be able to download the instructions to the car and have the car drive. So the idea is that the cars now will be able to travel within a few inches of each other at very high speeds with very few, if any, traffic accidents whatsoever. And it will also allow people in the cars then to be texting and watching video and talking to their friends and doing whatever they want in their car without risking lives around them. Uh, I hope you get a chance to see these cars. They're kind of freaky, actually. <laughs> um, Rosanna has been my translator in uh, Yerevan this week. I don't know that there's a translation of the word freaky into Armenian, so we'll have to, we'll have to work on that one. <laughs> I'm sorry some of these uh, colloquialisms will come out. Uh, do, you, do you know what freaky would be in Armenian? I'm not the last one to guess. How about strange or unusual, amazing, weird? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the last thing that I do want to mention is sustainability because all of us are very interested in preserving the planet's resources. There are standards emerging for the disposal of computers, how to pro uh, make products that are safer for the environment, so standards will also be at the heart of sustainability. Closer to our industry, which is electronic design, so semiconductors, computer chips, we are continuing to develop standards constantly. One of our newest technologies that's represented in this picture on the right, upper right, is 3D IC. So this is where you take the semiconductor chips and you stack them on top of each other. And that will allow you to have more chips in a smaller space that are more powerful and faster. And as you know, we always want smaller, faster, more powerful, um, using less power, and uh, more functions and more features in our, in our semiconductor chips. So in order to design a 3D IC, Many, many standards are required to say, how do you place the little pieces? How do you connect them? What materials do you use? So that's a really big in, uh, area of interest for us these days. So are things like verification methodologies. So if one, one, train, or one uh, semiconductor chip the size of your thumbnail has 10 billion transistors, 10 billion switches on it, you need to verify every single one of those before you manufacture it. And so all of our verification techniques require standard methods of, of ensuring that that chip is going to work properly when you manufacture it. Constantly, we need new standards for modeling these devices as we move from 20 nanometer designs now to 14 nanometer designs. We need to be able to model what that device is going to do in addition to how we manufacture it, what layers of material we place how we route the wires together on, on, on the multiple layers. And all of these modeling characteristics need standards. They need standard languages and standard formats to be able to represent them. The system level power intent is extremely important. So I keep talking about low power design and the need to use less battery power. Uh, today's smartphones are increasingly frustrating because their batteries go dead very, very fast. And so our industry is working very hard to say, at a system level, how can I shut down parts of the chip that aren't being operated and while firing up other ones? So when your screen goes dim because you're not using it, that's part of these low power design techniques. And all of them, of course, use standards. Uh, someone asked me in the last lecture about, is it difficult to get people to come together and agree upon a standard, especially when different companies have different interests? And the answer is, yes, absolutely. The purpose of standards is to attempt to drive consensus amongst uh, many, maybe different interests in different companies. 
So in order to develop a standard for low power, where we were representing this is what the chip should do in order to preserve its power, there were uh, seven or eight different companies that came to the table, some of us bitter competitors. We all contributed our technology, and we argued for um, several months before we chose the best aspects of each company's contributions, and then that became the formal standard. Oftentimes, these standards can take years and years to create. It depends on the conflicts that might come up. It depends on their business aspects. It depends on uh, the technical aspects, how difficult the material happens to be. That low power design intent standard that I just mentioned took us only five months to complete. It was kind of a, a miracle. The reason it was so short is because we had our customers demanding we must have this standard because we can't design these chips unless you create it. So I had the pleasure to actually sit in on those committees and, and watch the chair person at the time sort of orchestrate. You know, I know you don't appreciate this and I know that yours is this way, but he actually brought it all together in, in a, a phenomenal uh, success. Some of the other areas that we're creating interfaces, or pardon me, standards would be interfaces to debug the circuits. Um, Analog and mixed signal is very important. Uh, most of our industry has been digital because digital is very easy to work with. But um, analog and mixed signal are now the interfaces of all of the chips. They're, that's the part that interfaces with the real world. So you need analog to digital converters and an analog interface. So again, standards required there. And finally, design rule checks. So as we get smaller and smaller geometries, the factories and the, the manufacturing facilities, they're saying, you can't have a wire closer than you know, this certain distance, otherwise you'll have noise and you'll have signal transfer jumping across the wire. So all of those rules are written in the standard language. There are a lot of ways to create standards. You can have them created by um, industry and de facto usage. So everybody just happens to like it, it becomes a standard, it's not formal. There are formal standards organizations there are actually, and this is new to me, um, honestly, there are many major organizations around the world that use a national body representation model. And what that means is a country, each country comes together and votes one time, so one country, one vote, on a standard that will be used around the world. The most prominent and the most familiar organization that does this is known as ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, and they are uh, headquartered in Geneva. They are an assembly of the United Nations. So they get together, one country, one vote, and they set industry standards in the telecommunications industry. And they've been very effective at doing that for many years, and they will continue to do so. Other organizations that use this national body model are IEC, the International Electro Electrotechnical Commission, which is kind of near our semiconductor industry as well as ISO, so I'm sure you're familiar with ISO, ISO 9000 and that whole ISO family of, of quality standards and other standards. So that's the model they use. However, most interesting to me is what we are now describing as open stand, which is the modern paradigm for creating global standards. And it's also, uh, the easy way to think about it is market-driven standards as opposed to country and government-driven standards. So that's what I want to talk to you about next. So these types of market-driven standards have been created for decades. This is not a new concept. What's new is putting a name to it. Quite recently, several organizations that set global standards got together and said, you know, we realize that industries and markets have created these phenomenal standards around the world. Most noteworthy would be the internet. And they have nothing to do with governments or countries. And we would like to be able to describe these and have them recognized on par with those that come from ITU, IEC, and ISO to say that those standards are good and so are the market-driven ones that we've created in the world of the internet and other industries as well. So five organizations got together, um, the IEEE, and um, next year and the following year I have the honor of being the president of the IEEE Standards Association, so I'm really proud of this, this effort that we're doing. Uh, the first woman, by the way, in 100 years of them being in operation. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit scary. 
Jerry. But you know, and, and, and this is completely irrelevant to my talk today. But when I come to Armenia and I see so many young women studying technical fields, it's very encouraging to me because back in the United States, there's still maybe eight to ten percent women in you know, science, technology, engineering, and math. So you guys are absolutely awesome, and I just love to see you. You guys are good too. I don't want to minimize that. I see so many men, you know, day after day after day, and it's really nice to see a lot of a lot of uh, my female companions. Okay, back to the back to the so the IEEE, the Internet Society, um, W3C, which is the World Wide Web Consortium, the Internet Advisory Board, and the Internet Engineering Task Force. These are the organizations that have actually created and maintained HTTP, TCP IP, all of these types of things, 802, which comes from the IEEE. These are what make the Internet work. These are the things that have created the Internet around the world. And they are not controlled by government. They're not controlled by anybody. These organizations oversee them, and people come and make them advanced and, and make them work. So we all got together and said, let's put a name to market-driven standards, and let's talk about them more broadly so that governments will be able to say, oh, I can procure a product that's based on an, a market-driven standard in the same way I can procure a product that was developed based on an IT or an ISO standard. We uh, created a, there's a website, open-stand.org, you can get more information there if you're interested. But we said there are five principles, if you like, of what a market-driven standard is all about. And the first one is cooperation. This is extremely important because it means cooperation between standards organizations. So I said there's thousands of standards organizations out there. Each one of them has their own process, and they've proven that I can create a very effective and useful standard using my methods, and you may have done the same, but your methods are different. So we have to respect each other and say, I respect your process, and I'm not going to attempt to make you change just because I like my process better. And each of these organizations has slightly different ways of producing standards, and yet we say, obviously what you've done works, and obviously what we've done works as well. So let's not change each other's processes, let's respect and cooperate each other. The second uh, principle is adherence to the fundamentals of standards development. And these are actually ones that are uh, proved by the World Trade Organization, is these are the proper things that you need to do in order to create uh, effective standards. And the first is due process. You need rules and regulations and policies and procedures that can seem very cumbersome, but these are the things that control the outcome of the standard such that it's technically the best, that everybody's voice has been heard, that it's been vetted and approved, um, and it can be um, very tedious, I'll, I'll admit, it's very tedious to go through these processes, but they're required in order to ensure the quality of the outcome of the standard. The second fundamental is broad consensus. No one company can come, say, to the IEEE and say, I want my technology to be a standard and I don't care what anybody else says. That is not one of the principles of open standards. So you have to have consensus from not only industry, but also academia, from government, from individuals, from any interested parties. We all get together and say, this is what we agree upon and we make trade-offs and we make uh, um, you know, cooperation and consideration and uh, sometimes compromise. Well, a lot of times compromise. So broad consensus is different on di in different organizations, but IEEE defines consensus, and when they go through their balloting process, you have to have 75% approval in order for a motion to pass, not 50, 51%. So it's a super majority, which helps drive consensus more than just half of the participants agreeing. Transparency is very important. What this means is no secret deals behind closed doors. Everything that you do and all of the operations have to be clear and out in the open so that people can scrutinize that you're not doing something that is not fair to the general market and the general society. Balance is very important. This says no one company can dominate, no one interest can dominate. You have to have an equal balance between suppliers and consumers and regulators, and so on and so forth. I'll tell a story about not balance. One of the um, IEEE working groups years ago, one of the companies wanted to dominate the outcome of their vote. They were balloting on some feature of the standard. So this company actually hired temporary workers 
to come to the meeting and vote on their behalf. So a bunch of young people showed up, hi, we're here to vote on behalf of this company. And there, it was a shock throughout the entire standards organization. You, can't, you cannot do that. The company that, that, that was engaging in that, their upper management had no idea what was happening. And immediately they apologized publicly. They said, we will never do this again. And so because of that, the IEEE constantly watches, and so do the other organizations, uh, making sure that uh, there is fair balance, that uh, nobody's dominating and cheating. The final fundamental is openness. And what this means is that anybody who's interested is allowed to participate. So if you have a material interest in participating in a standard, be it you're representing your company, you're representing your industry, your uh, personal experience, you are allowed to participate in the development of these standards. So people cannot be shut out. Uh, and that's, that's very important. Now, one thing I will point out is open doesn't mean free. Sometimes people think that open standards mean they're free at no cost. But it's very expensive to produce standards. It takes a lot of resources. It takes not only people whose salaries are paid by companies or who are investing their personal funds, but it also takes computers and conference calls and facilities and food. <laughs> uh, and so openness means uh, open participation. But standards need to be available at reasonable cost, but they're never free. Uh, even the internet standards that you see that are free, they're funded through different funding models. Nothing in the world is free, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, the third principle is collective empowerment. And what this is embodying is the idea that an emerging economy will be equally as empowered as a mature economy. So emerging economies in smaller countries have as much say as those of big countries that have been established to themselves. And what this allows is smaller companies, emerging economies, to participate at the global standards table just like anyone else. And it's very, uh, it's very motivating, it's very inspiring, and it's something that smaller countries have not experienced before. They are used to saying, well, I guess I need to follow what China says, or I guess I need to follow what Europe says, or the United States, because I'm just a small guy, I don't have a voice. But now through collective empowerment, these smaller countries will be able to come and say, listen, you need to understand what my environment is like when you're creating standards for the smart grid. Um, I'll give a great example. I was in India a few years ago, and someone was proposing, well, we need to do this and that and the other with all of our IT infrastructure and so on and so forth so we can have an India smart grid. On the opposite side of the room, there were some Indian gentlemen saying, have you been to rural India? You don't understand that 60% of our power is stolen. So what you're proposing can never work in rural India where there are no substations, where there are no um, infrastructure. And so this type of arguing back and forth was fascinating to me, but it was a perfect example of collective empowerment. We the rural Indians have something to say and you need to listen to us before you create your uh, massive smartphone standard. Number four, availability. This is what I alluded to a minute ago, and uh, standards need to be available widely to everyone. If you say only this particular segment of society is allowed to use this standard to their advantage, then you're disadvantaging other aspects of the world, and that is absolutely not part of what the modern paradigm of global standards says. So availability, you can sell standards at a reasonable cost. You can give them away if you have other funding, but you have, absolutely have to make them available worldwide. The last one is really interesting and important. These standards need to be adopted voluntarily. As an industry, I need to be able to select the, the standards that will make my products the best. I, as a consumer, want to select products that are based on standards that serve my needs the most. I do not want a government dictating to me, you will all do it this way because we said so, because that could be inferior, that could stifle innovation. So I'm not saying that governments don't have an extremely important role. So if you want to you know, institutionalize and standardize a telephone system, it's very good for the government to step up and say, OK, everybody do it the same way. However, with market-driven standards, you want the market to say, you know, that technology is much better than this one, and I'd like to move there when I feel like it, as fast as I can, or as slow as I can if it's not, not quite, quite ready, so voluntary adoption. Um, anyway, you may, see, you may hear about this more, especially if you get involved in standards or um, any, any technology things, you may hear more about this. And, and if you're interested, there's a website. We have um, endorsements from people 
from countries I had never heard of, so it's truly a, a neat revolution. And, uh, yeah, from a standard person, it's pretty exciting. The rest of you may say, yeah, that's nice, but uh, anyway, your choice. <laughs> Yes. Uh, is stationary a voluntary adoption uh, probably is a mechanism to allow the market to orientate itself? And then the final decision is being made by the standardizing organization. For example, probably is the, the format wars for DVD, Blu ray discs, and eventually it was allowed to market kind of uh, could germinate, and then after that, uh, so, uh, that, that's exactly correct. The analogy of the um, of the uh, voluntary adoption was Blu-ray versus HD DVD, the format wars. Um, we we see them often. So those standards were created, Blu-ray, HD DVD. They were created by their separate organization and competing, absolutely competing. And what happened is then, because they were voluntary adopted by the consumer market, the consumers made the decision. I prefer Blu-ray, and the other one disappeared. So if, if Blu-ray and HD DVD had been national body standards, it would have been the governments sitting down together and saying, okay, which one do we want our citizens to use? And so that's why voluntary adoption is completely different than the national body model. What after that uh, uh, decision? Who made that decision after, that, uh, after Blu-ray won? The society made the decision, if you like. There was no entity that said, Blu-ray has won. It simply occurred. And slowly, HD, the, the, the suppliers of the HD DVD standard said, it's not what you meant. I think there was some event that decision after which everyone else mm -hmm. got to win the, the HD DVD. Yeah, the, 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 the decision I think that you're referring to, if I, if I remember correctly, is where a group of leading suppliers, leading manufacturers, got together and said, you know what? <laughs> they said, this HD one isn't working for us. We all are going to use Blu-ray. And then that momentum shifted because those companies, the, the industry said, this is the one we prefer. And, and they said that because they watched their consumers. Um, what, what's interesting to me is when I noticed that Blockbuster, you, you know the Blockbuster um, company that's almost out of business right now, but, but uh, when Blockbuster started carrying Blu-ray on their shelves instead of HD DVD, I think that was a big indicator that Blu-ray was going to, to finally win. But yes, so the companies themselves got together and said, you know, we think this is the right answer. But again, no government was involved, it was definitely market driven. But the logic uh, shows that uh, following this principle, after a short while, someone will go to the donuts. It will not stay in the free or spare affairs for everyone because following this principle after short while someone will dominate all of these principles and the society will nothing to do with this. Yeah, uh, dominance can be very distasteful. It can also be very effective. So I will use Apple computer as an example. So Apple's products are dominant. They clearly dominate the market and they do so with closed standards by the way. And society does nothing. Society says that's fine. Other <laughs> How many people have bought Apple products in the last year? Not me, by the way, because I, I stand for open standards, so I buy only Android. But it, it, again, it's society's choice. Um, people, uh, we were having a discussion at lunchtime that there was fear that Microsoft would dominate the world. And they did for a while. But now Google is starting to be the dominant player in the world. So I think it's a natural evolution. But it is not synopsis. It is not a small company. It is just uh, Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> it is just It is not the smallest one. They are the big companies. They are the dominant companies. Yeah, the, the big companies can dominate. Um, everybody's, everybody's smiling about synopsis. So, um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, they, 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 some people think Synopsis is dominating the industry, and others think we're a small player, so that's a matter of opinion. But, but the, the thing that's important about open standards like this, when you come to, for instance, the IEEE, and we have what we call an entity model for developing standards, every company gets one vote. So, so Synopsis vote has equal weight to Microsoft, equal weight to Cisco, equal weight to your startup company that's in your, in your house. And so that brings more of the consensus, that drives the broad, um, the broad consensus and the balance. Uh, 
Um, so, so it doesn't allow dominance. Uh, the balance prevents dominance from happening in the standards world. In the product world, you're right. You know, the products can dominate, but the standards themselves are created in, in a more fair way. If I could just add as an addendum to that, I think that the concept of, let's say, anti-monopoly, antitrust, that's not necessarily in this domain. That's a legal issue that sort of societies in different countries have different solutions or allowances or tolerance levels to. So that's, a, I mean, that's a separate, but very maybe, maybe related, but a separate issue. Standards are a useful benefit of the society. Yes, standards are a benefit for the society. They do not address, well, actually, in a way, they do. So, so yeah, monopolies and antitrust are part of the government to prevent those monopolies from occurring. When a company like Synopsys goes to acquire another company, we have to prove to our federal government that we participate in open standards with our competition. And that's part of the fundamental approval process for us to acquire other companies. So that, uh, that's why I mean it's a short uh, while well, related to the political, economic, other standards, not the open standards, which is related to fairly uh, separated between the companies, but it, uh, after short while China will follow the, the rush, for example, to find this issue of British with the United States. It is the political and economical issue, not the uh, open standards related with the technology issues. Yeah, I, 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 I think that's I think that's correct. If I understand the point, I believe that. Someone else had a question? Uh, not really, it was not a question. Oh. If I'm not mistaken, the question uh, regarding the ATDDD and the Blu-ray standards. The Blu-ray standards uh, definitely won because it was, uh, the encryption of Blu-ray standard simply was broken uh, a couple of days later than the ATDDD. So that was the, that was the major problem. But there was a technical flaw yeah. with, with it. Um, and, and yet, I think if the market had wanted and said, well, we know there's a technical flaw, but we happen to like that standard better, they would fix that technical flaw and take it forward. So there's always a balance between technology, the technical aspect, and the, and the business aspect of it, the political aspect. It's a delicate balance, too. <laughs> oh, question. Yes, yes. Uh, regarding the battle of the uh, Ray Camp versus the uh, if I'm not mistaken, a major role has played the uh, Hollywood companies, which uh, preferred Blu-ray over the HDVD. And uh, what about the openness and fairness of communication of Sony and Philips with the 20th Century Fox or some other Hollywood company and Toshiba with its HDVD? Um, he's asking about the competition and the collaboration between Sony and uh, Hollywood and Motion Picture Groups and Philips and uh, I remember reading the whole story and doing a lot of research, but that was a few years ago. So I'm afraid I to misspeak. So I'm not going to go into into details because I might say something that's not true. But you're absolutely right. The tension was incredible, and because you're because you are competing in such a large market and an important economic market, the, the deals that are made between the companies and the suppliers and the motion picture people are intense and powerful and very, very real. And so when organizations, standards organizations say, we produced a standard that was fair because we allowed the broad consensus and we allowed the balance and we allowed the openness, then those standards will have more credibility than ones that were done behind the scenes. So, uh, and, and closed standards can be extremely effective. You know, if you have a technology and it is so awesome and irresistible and you keep it to yourself and you make a lot of money, there's really nothing wrong with that. But at some point, as an industry leader, you'll be expected to potentially open that up. Um, is this true when iTunes was first created, the format of iTunes was proprietary, and then they moved to MP3? They still use Apple. Yeah, they used Apple, but now they support MP3 because the industry demanded. So Apple built a wonderful environment around iTunes being proprietary, but then market forces and society said, you know, enough is enough. I want to be able to put my songs on, on other, other devices. I'm glad you guys are finding this interesting. 
usually, usually when I say I work in standards, people go, oh. <laughs> okay, so let me wrap this up a little bit by saying education for standards is really important. And most of us who work on standards never learned this at the university level. We learned it once we went into industry, we learned it the hard way, we made mistakes, we did things we wish we had never done. Um, we probably weren't as effective as, as we could have been learning you know, on the job as, as we went along. So we're recognizing that if we can get material into the curriculum of universities to show students the importance of standards and how they're created, then when you enter the workforce, you'll be better prepared to do a better job than we've done, and you'll get the standards out more effectively and more efficiently and less painfully. So um, knowledge about standards from a student's perspective will help you not only facilitate communication, obviously, but um, once you are performing your professional tasks, you'll know how to do these in the same way. There's a, a standard that's very well known in our industry called System Verilog. It's for representing circuits. So if you learn those standards in, in universities, then when you go into industry, you immediately can work with other uh, design engineers who are familiar with that standard. Um, and of course, it forms the foundation and the framework for innovation and um, product quality and interoperability. And interoperability meaning you know, things plug together easily. Um, these are some of the benefits of being able to put standards into your curriculum. Um, obviously, you get skills ahead of time, just like when you're using synopsis tools in your studies. Now you can be learning the standards and you have that much uh, extra experience once you graduate. Um, and I think the bottom one is interesting too. You're going beyond theory, so standards are about as practical of an experience as you could possibly have. So let me show you a little bit about the IEEE. Who in here is a member of the IEEE? <laughs> that, this, this is fine. Let, let me back up. I'll explain the IEEE a little bit. The IEEE is the world's largest professional society. They have 420,000 members around the world in, in our field, electronics, electrical engineering, information technology, communications technology, microwave, biomedical. They have 38 societies that address all of these technical fields. Mm -hmm. And they provide career development. They provide 30% um, of the world's literature is published from the IEEE in our fields. So massive publications and, and technical knowledge base is available. Um, and so I encourage you, even as students, to join. I joined as a student a long time ago, and the IEEE has helped my career all along. Uh, very important organization and very inexpensive to join as a student and um, can, can really benefit your, your entire career, your life cycle as an engineer. Um, the IEEE has six major areas of focus. Um, they publish, they have technical activities and research and so forth. Um, I, I Triple E USA needs to change a bit. The, the, um, that's an artifact of the I Triple E being a very old institution. But that's where all the career development comes from. And also things like life insurance, medical insurance benefits can be obtained through I Triple E um, at lower cost, perhaps, than you would get on your own. Um, member and geographical activities look at regions all around the world. What are your needs from an engineering perspective? How can we get together and learn from each other? Um, finally, at the top, we have the educational activities. One of the fundamental beliefs of the IEEE is to improve the education of engineers all around the world. A lot of effort, a lot of resources put into education. And of course, standards, the Standards Association that produces, right now, I think we have over a thousand active standards, that anything from Wi-Fi to nuclear safety standards to um, one of my favorite examples is IEEE has a standard for the clothing that power line workers wear when they're dangling out of a helicopter <laughs> to keep them safe. <laughs> so the IEEE has a massive amount of standards. In fashion. <laughs> in fashion, yeah. <laughs> How wide should the lapel be as a standard? <laughs> um, so between the, the ed educational activities and the standards association, it was recognized that how can we teach students, how can we bring education about standards to the world? And the standards education committee was formed, and that's where the resources are provided, and it's a really great committee. Um, what their approach is, is they want to reach the audience at the basic level by providing a variety of things in addition to course material. Um, I'll, I'll talk about the grants in a minute because that's 
kind of the most fun um, because it means money for the students. <laughs> uh, grants, there's an online magazine. There is a speakers bureau where industry experts can come and speak at your universities. Um, there's a lot of cooperation with other standards developing organizations, and those thousands out there that I mentioned. Um, and certainly developing products and services for universities as part of this committee. This is the website that you can find, standardseducation.org. And this is where you can find the course material, um, all types of information. And what's really good to know is that this is available at no cost. It's been uh, funded by the National Science Foundation. And so you can obtain all these materials without paying for them. Here's a picture of the, the website itself. Um, one of the features is the 802 family of standards, which is Ethernet and Wi-Fi, are now available to everyone at no cost. They're being funded by industry behind the scenes, and so you can actually obtain those standards if you want to study them and build projects around them and uh, use them in your, in your academic activities. There are tutorials and case studies available. Um, one of them is on System Verilog that I worked on a long time ago. It probably needs to be updated by now. But you can see some of the examples. Engineering technology, standards in cellular telephony, um, standards in electrical power systems. So there's all types of uh, uh, courses and, and information that you can use there to learn about them. So the grants. So these grants are given to students who supply a proposal for some type of a project that would use a standard, an IEEE standard. And if your proposal is approved, then you will receive 500 US dollars, and your faculty mentor receives 300 US dollars. So it's good for the professors as well as the students. Um, you have to just describe specifically how you will use 802 or System Verilog in a, in a project. And all of these results um, are published as student application papers. So it can be very nice on your resume. It can be a very good um, opportunity to do a, a special project while you're in school. Here is the distribution by region of who has received these grants over the last few years. Uh, I keep saying that when I come back to Armenia next time, I'll expect a bar that shows Armenia way over to the right and all the student grants coming from here. And the actual um, acceptance rate is quite high. So over the last few years of 128 applications that were received, 83 of them were approved. So uh, that's a very high rate of approval. So. Uh, uh, the comp it's not that the competition isn't really fierce, but it's that uh, you know, there's a lot of high quality students like yourselves that are applying for these grants. So do apply for a grant if you're interested. Here is the online magazine. That's me down below, my colleague. Uh, he's he's uh, very active in the Standards and Education Committee uh, from India, and so he's got you know, in his heart we need to educate engineers. So you've got the magazine. Um, here's an example of one of the most popular workshops, and that's um, Understanding 802. 802 is a very complex standard, as you can imagine, um, moving from local area networks to wide area networks to wireless to mobile wireless, and uh, this tutorial will help people understand. It's a full day of you know, all the details of 802. If any of the instructors are interested in embedding this in there, you know, it could be very helpful. Right, Wi-Fi. So 802 is a big family. 802 is Ethernet, so wired, as well as Wi-Fi, which is 802.11. And then there's 802.15. There's, there's a whole variety of them. Um, right, right. Yeah, all the 802.11, ABCD, yeah, that's all part of the Entropy family and, and that's part of that, that, that workshop. Um, we'll provide these slides and this information here. People at the IEEE that you can contact, and uh, then my colleague at the bottom from synopsis actually if you're interested more in IEEE standards and education. So I encourage you, if this seems of interest to you, to certainly become a member of the IEEE in your local chapter. There's a lot of good support for meeting other students and other people in our industry. Uh, be aware of standards when you start your field of work and think about these things. Oh, you know, I'm going to build a product. Should it conform to certain industry standards? Uh, would I like to take my invention once it becomes stable and turn it into a standard. Um, can you imagine how proud you'd be if you'd say, I was the one that invented Wi-Fi. <laughs> you know, that'd be pretty cool. <laughs> and you probably could. Who knows what the next one will be. So um, you know, please keep standards in mind as you go forward. And um, I'm happy to answer questions or move on to the next topic, whatever you guys would like. Am I taking too much time? We're OK for time? All right. OK, the next.